Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another evening of Northshire Live. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Rachel Person, the event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Saratoga Springs, New York, here with my friend and colleague, Davith Wood, event manager for Northshire Bookstore in Manchester Center, Vermont, who is going to be quiet this evening because he is having um, rural Vermont internet troubles. Um, a couple of notes before we get started with the, the good stuff this evening. Um, first of all, you may notice that this evening's event is being recorded for future broadcast on our YouTube channel. However, fear not, we have the settings arranged so that it is only recording those of us who are unmuted and speaking in this lovely little yellow box. So um, if you have your video on, you will not be part of that recording for posterity. Um, in light of that, if you have any questions this evening for our authors, please use the chat function to type them in. Um, I will save them up and I will pose your questions for you at the end of the evening when we get to the audience Q&A. Um, and then the last note before I introduce our authors is a word of thanks to all of you. Um, as I think everyone knows at this point, it's been a, a not so easy year for independent businesses in general and independent bookstores in particular. Um, and Northshire's survival um, over this past year is really due to the incredible support we've gotten from our friends and neighbors and customers like you. Um, we could not have done that without you and we are deeply grateful for this. Mm -hmm. um, so now it is my great pleasure to get to, get to introduce a very special event tonight. Dorset Vermont author Liza Ketchum is here for two new books, her memoir, The Last Garden, out from Northshire's own Shires Press and her co-authored children's book, Begin with a D. Liza is the author of 17 books for young people. Her historical novels include two with Vermont connections, The Life Fantastic, a vaudeville story from 1913, and Where the Great Hawk Flies, winner of the Massachusetts Book Award for Young Adults. She was a founding faculty member at Hamline University's MFA in Writing for Children and Young Adults program, and her books have appeared on the ALA's best book lists and the New York Public Library's 100 titles for reading and sharing. A citizen scientist volunteer, her articles about the natural world have appeared in newspapers and on public radio. She's going to tell us about The Last Garden, her memoir that chronicles her life as a gardener and takes the reader on her personal gardening journey that begins and ends with Vermont. Afterwards, we'll get to hear from the other con contributors to begin with a B. The first 10 customers who be order begin with a B from Northshire will get a special packet of beef friendly seeds. Jacqueline Briggs Mar Martin is author of 21 picture books for children, including Snowflake Bentley, Aldicott Medal winner, and Creek Finding, which received a Green Earth Award for Environmental Writing for Children and a Riverby Award for Natural History Books for Young Readers. Phyllis Root has written more than 50 books for children. She won the Riverby Award twice and also the Horn Book Award. And finally, the book's illustrator, Claudia McGeehy, the author-illustrator of eight prize-winning children's books. She has twice received honors from the Seagird Olson Environmental Institute. Please join me in welcoming to Northshire Live Jacqueline Briggs-Martin, Phyllis Root, Claudia McGeehy, and Liza Ketchum. Greetings and welcome everyone. I'm trying to see myself here. Can you all see me? Okay. Thanks so much to the Northshire Bookstore for hosting this event. And special thanks to Debbie Raga of Northshire Press for shepherding the last garden through the publication process and creating the book's beautiful design. We're so excited to share these books with you all. I'm gonna talk about The Last Garden. Phyllis and Jackie will discuss our collaboration on Begin With a B. Claudia will share a PowerPoint about her illustration process and Phyllis will read the B book. We will have time for questions at the end. Bees, gardens and flowering plants are obviously connected, which is one reason we decided to pair these books tonight. But serendipity also brought the two books together. That Persian word is defined as the faculty of making fortunate discoveries at the right time. Serendipity brought me to teach alongside Phyllis and Jackie at Hamlin University in St. Paul. In our summer residencies, we woke early to walk through St. Paul's neighborhoods, admiring the lush gardens that filled so many backyards. On our rare times when we had a free evening, the three of us sat in Phyllis's stunning garden and watched bees and butterflies dip in and out of her flowers. I sometimes told stories about the gardeners in my life, and one day, Phyllis or Jackie, I'm not sure which, suggested that I write a garden memoir. At this point, I remembered a long ago retreat I'd shared with writers Ellen Whitlinger and Pat Lowry Collins. I'd written some memoir pieces I called the Wheezy Stories, which is our family's name for my grandmother. These sketches featured the Dorset Garden where I spent my summer childhood. 
I realized I could shape a memoir if I profiled other family members and friends who influenced the way I gardened throughout my life. If you read the book, you will meet these gardeners, including a few who might be familiar to some folks who are listening tonight. Early on, I decided that each chapter in the memoir would begin with the name of a plant that inspired a particular memory. I hoped to find someone who could illustrate those plants. When I told my friend and fellow writer, Karen Hess, that I was looking for an illustrator, she suggested the Brattleboro artist, Bobby Angel. Bobby agreed to take this on and her gorgeous black and white drawings bring these plants to life. Um, I'm not sure, can everyone see this? Yes. This is the oak page, and um, it just gives you a sense of, of Bobby's beautiful drawings. Oaks were my dad's favorite tree, so this is, this is his chapter. And um, another plant that appears a few times in the memoir is Alice's Rose, which was cultivated by Putney's famous landscape gardener, Alice Hallway. Randy and Karen Hess have a gigantic version of this rose in Brattleboro. It's a descendant of one I used to have in my own garden. Serendipity again. The rose happened to be in full bloom when Bobby was beginning her drawings. She went to the Hesses, took photographs, and, and created the book's beautiful cover. You see that? Mm -hmm. Bobby, if you are listening, I hope you know how grateful I am for your gorgeous work. So many readers have told you, told me how much they admire your drawings. One other sweet moment I'd like to share. Years ago, when Phyllis and I taught at Vermont College, she suggested a prompt that might inspire a personal memory. Neither one of us remember the prompt, but the first chapter in the book called Timothy, not the person, but the grass, grew out of the piece I wrote from that exercise. So I'd like to read a short excerpt from that first chapter. And the way I've set this book up is that each chapter begins with a quote at the top, then the name of the plant and the drawing. And the plant is in is named in English and Latin. And for those of you who are tuning in, who live around here, the scene takes place near my family's first home in Dorset Hollow. Timothy, Fleum Pretense. Oh, the quote at the top is from William Cullina, native trees, shrubs, and vines. Plants have an ability that no animal does. They can theoretically live forever. <clears throat> The first garden is a meadow. I am four years old, gripping the cross pieces of a hay wagon. It creaks and sways as a pair of Belgians lean into their harnesses, pulling us up the steep hillside. The fragrance of new mown hay curing in the sunshine tickles my nostrils. The scent mingles with the scent of horse piss, sweat, and the smoke from Hope Hazelton's cigarette dangling from a corner of her mouth. Above us, the lip of the hayfield curves beneath the blue sky like the rim of a teacup. The huge horses are the color of butterscotch. Their massive shoulders ripple. Their tails flick through clouds of flies on their rumps. Their hooves, big as dinner plates, could crush me in an instant, but I'm not afraid. I lean back against Hope's sturdy legs as she drives the team. I chew on a stalk of Timothy, imitating Hope and her cigarette. Hope wears overalls, the denim so worn it's almost white. Her hands, deeply grooved with swollen knuckles, cup the reins. The team responds to her slightest touch as if she were connected to their velvet muzzles. I know the feel of those muzzles because Hope once lifted me so I could touch the soft skin around their nostrils. The delicate hair tickled my fingertips. Back you babe, she calls to the lead horse. The team jerks to a halt and I almost lose my balance. Hope's husband Linwood and their daughter Patty 4K from raked warrows into the wagon bed, then climb into the wagon where they stomp on it, jouncing up and down like clumsy dancers. Hope nudges my shoulder. I look up, her eyes twinkle. Her gray curls wet with sweat are plastered to her forehead. Want to drive, she asks. I nod. She grabs me under her armpits and settles my feet on her knees, pulls me back against her body and gives me the reins. I wrap my small fingers around the wide leather traces. Hope clucks to the team. The Belgians surge, their power coursing into my arms like an electric current. The thrust of their weight yanks me forward as they lean into the hill. When we reach the stone wall at the top of the meadow, the Belgians stop to blow and a bird flies up out of the grass, wings beating. Meadowlark, 
Hope says. Could be we disturbed her nest. I look down the steep hill. My whole world lies below. Our white house with its slate roof. The hen house where my girls, as I call our chickens, lay their eggs. The weeping elm that trails its branches into the meadowy river. With a thrill, I realize I'm higher than my house, higher even than my tall, lanky father. This is the only world I know. I've never been out of Vermont, and I'm too young to understand the circle of life in this hayfield. The field seems enormous as the wagon climbs to the inverted bowl of the sky. My world is one of scented grass, green hills, obedient animals, seasonal chores, kind neighbors, and Eden. So just a few words now, I'm gonna to switch to bees. As I began to work on the garden book, Phils and Jackie and I were learning about the frightening diseases and losses affecting honeybees and native bees. In another serendipitous moment, I joined a group in Watertown, Massachusetts called Friends of Bees. This group shared information about gardening with native plants to attract pollinators. They also showed a film about the rusty patched bumblebee. Phyllis and Jackie and I then learned that the rusty patch was the first bumblebee to be listed on the US Fish and Wildlife's endangered species list. We decided that this bee would be the star of our next book. So Phyllis will now describe our writing process from the bee book's beginning. Isaac, thank you. That was a wonderful reading. Um, thank you all for having us and for coming. And I see at least three faces I haven't seen in a long time, which is so exciting. Um, it's just a joy to see you. I'm just going to talk a very little bit about how three of us wrote one story. Um, we, we found our own way to the bees um, from separate directions. And for me, it was, uh, it was the wildflowers, the native wildflowers in my garden that I love. And when you have native flowers, you have native bees. Um, but once we started on the journey of writing about it, I realized I had so much to learn. So we did a lot of research. Uh, one time I had been in a, a native prairie, I had seen a sort of a fat bumblebee fly into a hole in the ground. And I thought, well, that's a strange thing because I didn't know at the time that about 70% of all native bees are ground dwellers. And the more we learned about this amazing queen bee and how she carries all of next year's colony in her body, um, the more in awe we were. So we have collaborated before and Jackie will tell you more about that. But our, our process uh, has kind of become, one of us will sit down and write a first draft. And that is what I did. Once I had as much information as I could find, and I did something I'd never done before. I, I took big sheets of paper and I just started sort of scribbling and trying to figure out ideas and what kind of points we wanted to have in it. And it looks a little bit like a bumblebee zigging and zagging, which was not my intent. It was just a different way for me to think about story. And then eventually when there was text, I did the same thing. I cut the text up and started pasting it and trying to figure out, well, if we have this, then we go to this. And what do we do with this? Uh, eventually, there was a draft we could all focus on and work on. A lot of it was a series of questions, you know, what's inside this hole in the ground? What is she looking for as she zigs and zags, this bumblebee queen? Um, we did a lot of conference calling and emailing back and forth, but at some point we decided we wanted to be in the same physical space. We are in Jackie's in Iowa, I'm in Minnesota, Liza's in Vermont and Massachusetts. And so we planned a retreat in Wisconsin where we spent several days just focusing on the, I'm sure fewer than a thousand words of this story, looking at every word, revising, uh, reading it aloud, revising again, trying to get every word as exactly right as we could. And at one point we started cutting things up again and we made a kind of a dummy um, this is not the dummy that Claudia is going to tell you about later because we don't do it for the artist. We don't do it for the editor. We simply do it for ourselves. We cut up the story, we put it on sheets of paper and we're looking to see, is there enough? Does it fit the form of a picture book? Have we made the best use of page turns? Uh, is there something for the artist? Is there too much text? So 
once again, we're revising. And at the end of the retreat, we had what we thought was a solid draft, which we sent to an editor that Jackie and I had worked with before and to whom we talked before we went on the retreat. He'd ask what we were working on. And we said, well, the rusty patch bumblebee. And he said, oh, well, send me what you've got when you get back. And we did, and he liked it. And he took it to committee and they liked it. And so they offered us a contract and, and then they said, uh, he said, what about Claudia McGee for the illustrator? And we said, oh yes, yes, please. Uh, so that's how we got from, let's write about the rusty past bumblebee to a draft that we could work with. And now Jackie's going to tell you more about the collaborative part of it. Thank you, Phyllis. I love your charts. Mm -hmm. I love how our book started. And I'm going to actually show you some evidence of our collaboration, if I can get this all arranged here. Um, picture book writers such as myself who don't illustrate are familiar with collaboration. It always occurs between writer and illustrator, though in some cases, the writer and the illustrator never even talk about the book. But out there somewhere is a shared vision that they collaborate on. With this book, we were so lucky, first of all, that we had Claudia, and second of all, that we could actually talk with her. Claudia and I only live 20 miles apart. So when we are not um, isolated because of the virus, we actually, she shares illustrations with me. This time we couldn't do that, but she did keep us informed of her progress and she helped us fine tune the text as she went along. She also added essential elements to the book that were not in the text. The children that you see on the cover were Claudia's idea and they became a really wonderful part of the book. As for the writing collaboration, I really believe no one of us working alone could have written this book. And I can't separate out our strands. I just know that it was a collaborative effort. We each brought our separate perspectives to the story and we had a wonderful time doing it. Our collaborative efforts actually began with sea turtles. We wanted to tell the story, a story of sea turtles near Baja, California. We researched and wrote, sometimes apart, sometimes together. Writing and revising often involves cutting and pasting, as Phyllis said. We wrote and researched this story for more than a year. We sent it out for more than a year. It, it never found a home. But we learned that we loved collaborating. We discovered that having a team to do the writing made the process more yeasty. And of course, less authors struggling alone in the attic. So we decided we wanted to do another collaborative project and begin with a B is the result of that work. As Phyllis has said, she did the first draft and sent it to us. We talked about taking out a word here and there, maybe moving a bit of text, but we loved that draft. And as Phyllis said, we wanted to get together. So we met at a rental cabin in Wisconsin with another writer friend of ours, Marsha Qualley, whom some of you will recognize the name. And we worked for several days. We put every word through the stress test. And we decided to streamline. We had quite a bit of extra textual sidebars. We tightened our focus to the wonder of the rusty patch bumblebee and all bumblebees. When she goes into hibernation in the fall, the queen has in her little body everything she needs to make next year's colony of bees. And her body is smaller than an inch. That is really um, the wonder of her story. And that is what we kind of organize the story around. There are actually, and there we are during doing our uh, putting every word under pressure. There are more words in the back matter, I think, by far than there are in the text. We wanted the back matter to be informative, yet accessible and inviting. 
And Claudia's illustrations really draw people into the text. But writing the back matter required much long distance collaboration. We did more research. Every time we learned a new fact, we revised the back matter. One writer working alone might have quit before we got the back matter to where it is now, but we kept each other going. And that is the joy of collaboration. We keep each other going until we all agree we have reached the finish line. Now, Claudia will tell you about getting going and getting to the finish line with the illustrations. Right. Thank you very much, Jackie and Liza. Thank you for that beautiful reading of your new garden book. I am going to share my screen now. All right, I think I'm set here. Um, I have been to your wonderful store, Nurshire. Thanks so much for hosting us. I was there a few years ago. I wrote and illustrated a book about Rockwell Kent, who lived in your area. He was an American painter who lived in the 1920s uh, and in Arlington and did a few landscapes of the beautiful country around your, your area. This is called Mount Equinox and it is in the Chicago Art Institute collection. So I get to see it every once in a while. So that is my connection to Vermont and I hope I can get back there again sometime. Oh, it is a great day when I receive an invitation to a manuscript, especially when it is written by three of my favorite authors and people who I admire so much. Um, oops. My um, button isn't going. Um, that's so funny. Let me see if I can, my forward isn't working. Weird. Never had that happen before. Let's see. I might have to stop and go again. I'm really sorry. It started okay, but hmm. just a sec here. I've got my IT coming down. We might be able to figure something out. I hear laughter back there. What do you think, Dan? Oh, just that instead. Let me see. Now it seems to be working. Okay, so when I read the manuscript, I was just in love with it. I loved the environmental message. I loved the flowing language. I loved the inspirational educational content, but I most of all loved that there was a female lead role, the rusty patch bumblebee queen. Uh, but I knew I had a lot of research ahead of me. I thought I knew some things about bumblebees. I knew they're cute, their buzz with some fuzz, they're stripy. I thought their behavior would be like honeybees, only big honeybees, but I had a lot to learn and I found out how awesome they were. And I wanted to make sure that that was part of my illustration story, just as Phyllis and, and Jackie have mentioned. Uh, She's just one tiny bee and from her body comes a whole colony. And you only have to look at her face to know that she gets it done too. <laughs> um, Rusty Patch Bumblebee, there are about 49 different uh, species of bumblebee in the US and the Rusty Patch Bumblebee has that, the workers at least have these really gorgeous little orange bottoms that I was very excited to draw. But beyond that, I didn't really know a lot about bee anatomy, so I had to learn quickly. I learned that they have four wings. I never knew that before, that there are two big and two tiny ones. I learned that their antenna bent at the head and they had 12 sections. I learned they have five eyes, the two compound eyes and um, the three little simple eyes in the middle of her forehead. Rusty patch bumblebees have short faces. Sometimes uh, other bumblebees have longer faces and I had to remember that in my renderings. Pollen basket is located on her hind legs. Six legs, don't forget them. Rusty patch bumblebee queens have no rusty patch. So that impacted how I drew the first bees in the first few pages of the book. Another huge surprise was that this is a bumblebee nest, right? It's uh, so different from the orderly honeybee hives that we think of. 
Um, they're very organic looking. They're made up of these waxy vessels that the workers and the queen makes and they incubate the eggs and the larvae in these and also store nectar for uh, the colony. Here's another um, photo of them. Uh, they're amazing. They uh, look like uh, something that uh, the architect Gaudi would make, very organic and mm -hmm. lovely. So very early on, I start to book research. Uh, luckily for me, bumblebees are a really great subject, bees in general, so I had a lot of reference to look for online, of course, too. Um, field research is like the honeymoon stage of uh, a picture book. Um, project and I got to visit a lot of arboretums around um, around the area and even attend a workshop where we uh, kind of uh, uh, a bee workshop where we were identifying bees and catch and release looking at them and I like to joke with my family that I almost earned a PhD doing this book because there is so much to learn before you go on especially with a nonfiction book but the Words, the author's words are my anchor. And this particular phrase I loved and it became kind of my mantra for as I was working um, through the book. And here's the wonder, and here's a wonder of this gorgeous creature that does so much all by herself. And what does she see? What does she feel? It's all the kind of questions that I want to be asking too. So my illustrations can match the words of the book. And just like the authors, I love to cut and paste. I'll take the manuscript and see how things are flowing. Um, again, like uh, Phyllis was saying, I wanna see if there's good page turns, page turns that are obvious. So I make a little dummy like this very early on. And then um, I make thumbnails. They're really small um, drawings the size of thumbs um, that I start to really get the feel of the book. Very small, quick blink ideas for what I think the illustrations should look like. So beginning from the thumbnail to a rough illustration to a scratch board, and I'll talk about these stages um, a little later on here too, to the final work. You can get an idea of the stages there. And then I go on after we've kind of committed to trim size, I've talked to the editor and um, we've talked about the thumbnails. Um, I go on to full scale pencil roughs. So I'm doing a lot of research here. I have a, a little feline helper usually in the studio somewhere. Again, just um, pasting in where the um, text will be going. And it's still very fluid here. You can see the uh, authors were still kind of um, uh, playing around with the uh, words, not playing around, but um, still solidifying what the words would be. Um, this picture was taken in late January of 2020, and this is probably Jackie's last visit to see me. I had a few of the roughs done and she was having a glance at them. So, and there, um, I do like to put my roughs kind of down on the ground to see how the flow is going. I might make another dummy at this point. That's um, uh, just a small scale of the whole book. And then it's time for Scratchboard, which is my main medium. So you might be familiar with it, you might not, but Scratchboard is a very thin board that has a clay chalk uh, inside layer covered with an India ink on the outside. And I take an X-Acto blade and I scratch what I want white and leave what I want black. So I might start with a very a simple drawing like this. I um, then transfer the drawing onto the top of my scratch board with chalk and make guidelines. And then I start scratching. Uh, when I get the final black and white, I will scan it into Photoshop and then print it onto watercolor paper. And the final watercolor or the final color I do old school on, the, um, on my board. So this is a little quick time, time lapse of about a 25 minute B drawing, B scratch board, um, condensed down to about 50 seconds or so here. So you can see, I, I, I'd like to get the outline of some major part of the drawing done first, then I can start doing the, uh, the little details. 
my father-in-law calls me the human milling machine because it really, at this point, it really does look kind of like that. And uh, voila, it's done. I wish the rest of the book went that fast, but that gives you an idea. So at the final stage here, I'm looking at a lot of reference still, and uh, I found a dead bumblebee in the driveway, and she was just perfect for coming in to be my muse for one of the pages here. And I do have a little anecdote about her. I started smelling this funny smell in my studio after a couple of days of bringing her in and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. All of a sudden I bent my nose down to this little creature and it was a her. So she was so tiny, but she had a powerful odor. And so this is all I have of my muse left, but she is part of the book for sure. I work very small. You can see uh, right kind of at 11 o'clock on the penny there is the smallest bumblebee I had to draw in the book. I'm constantly looking at references as I'm working in here. So I've got my iPhone, which is a great uh, tool for illustrators now to reference. Here's just a quick sequence of um, the middle part of the book. There's a spread about how the pupae develop. And so I couldn't quite figure out what I wanted to do, but guided by the words, of the authors, now are they bees? Almost, they're pupae. One week, two weeks, inside the cocoon, pupae turn into bees later. But first of all, I had to see what pupae look like, what bumblebee pupae. And I found online a wonderful um, study that had been done about the development stages of um, bumblebee pupae. So I thought that might be a good way to work them into a, um, a composition. So that's what I did. Here's me working at the computer. It's actually a little confusing what got dark when, and I finally uh, figured it all out. So here's the thumbnail to uh, rough, to final scratch board, to colored, to then in the book. So the end of the scratch board comes finally, and I get to color the art, which is one of my favorite bits. I'll just whiz through these here. This is a real quick little uh, motion of um, doing the uh, bumblebee nest, which is quite monochrome. And here's the final art. Uh, it was easy to paint, but it was really difficult to scratch board. Lots of monotonous cells there, but I got through it. And sometimes I even color what's outside my window, seasonally at least. So it's just an example of that constantly looking for um, reference for drawings that I take back real time into my own book uh, work. And then about the same time I'm doing the scratch board, we start thinking about covers and the editor and I will uh, kind of uh, talk about what could be some, um, some choices we could go to. And here's some that we came up with, but they chose what was um, the final image here with the children in the background that became the final cover. A lot of people ask me, well, how long does it take to do a book? And it takes a couple, well, this one took a couple years. And if you look at this chart here representing two years, uh, 12 o'clock is January of 2019 when I received the manuscript. You see the research is a few months, thumbnails going into um, pencil roughs at the bottom of January, 2020, scratch board, and the final art take the last few months. But you will notice that, oops, uh, shoot, let's see if I can get this going. Yeah, it was a tough year last year, as everybody knows, COVID hit about the same time that I started the scratch board, um, the final art. There's just a lot going on, we had, um, racial inequities to be reckoned with, and we're still carrying on that conversation, and um, climate change events on either coast, all over the place, all over the world. And in Iowa, we had a derecho in August, which um, uh, left most of the region without power, and our house had, uh, we went without power for a week. So I had to draw by campfire, camp light, I mean. Campfire, yeah, that would've been nice too. And then we lost my poor Fove, our studio kitty. So there was loss and uncertainty around every corner. She had a great life though and helped me through three books. So happy to see that. 
And what really got me through uh, the pandemic is nature, just being out in nature. And um, I happened to be in my garden. I also want to say all the authors I know are, are uncomforted by their gardens and nature as well. Um, so I was out in the garden looking at my Joe Pye weed and I looked at this bee, this bumblebee, and I could see that she had a rusty patch and it looked like it was very similar to what I'd been drawing. And um, I decided to submit these photographs to the Bumblebee Watch, which is a kind of citizen um, scientist tracking uh, and observing bumblebees. And a couple months later, um, the Xerxes uh, biologist verified that I indeed had seen a rusty patch bumblebee. So that was the ultimate gift of this book was that, you know, there was the bumblebee right in my backyard that I had been drawing all along. So, and now I think we're gonna go back to Phyllis who will read us the bumblebee story. So I'll stop sharing here. Thank you. And then we'll be happy to answer any questions. Jackie's gonna share the book. Begin with a bee. What's inside this hole in the ground? One bee, one queen rusty patch bumblebee waiting all winter long. And here's the wonder. Her tiny body, not even an inch, holds everything she needs to create a whole colony of bees, this year's bees. What else waits all winter under the ground? Seeds and roots for flowers that bloom early and late, flowers with nectar and pollen for bees. Sun shines, earthworms, seeds and roots sprout and grow, flowers open. And that one queen rusty patch bumblebee crawls from the ground, flies flower to flower, maybe plum blossom, wild geranium, shooting star. What is she searching for? Nectar and pollen. She eats, 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 and eats and zigs and zags flying low. Where will she nest? Underground best, an abandoned mouse burrow, an old mole hole, or a hollow stump, a fallen tree. Even an empty coat pocket will do. What will she make when she finds a nest? All by herself. She builds a pot with wax from her body and fills it with nectar for days too cold or rainy to fly and days when she sits on the eggs she will lay. All by herself, she carries pollen in the pollen baskets on her back legs. Once in the nest, she shapes a lumpy pollen ball then lays her eggs, seals each egg safe inside. All by herself, she sits on the eggs and shivers to keep them warm. One day, two days, three days, maybe four days, maybe five, then eggs hatch. Are they bees yet? No, little white grubs, no eyes, no legs, eating machines. All by herself, the queen flies, flower to nest, nest to flower, wild lupin, wild cherry, service berry, feeding her larva, nectar and pollen. They grow and shed their skins, grow and shed, grow and shed, grow until they poop just once, then make cocoons with strands of silk from glands near their mouths. Now are they bees? Almost, they're pupae. One week, two weeks inside the cocoon, pupae turning into, finally, Bees, worker bees, all of them female, none of them queens, all with a rusty patch on their backs. Some workers clean the nest, some workers fly to find nectar and pollen to feed the queen. 
Again and again, the queen lays more eggs, as many as 500 over the summer. More eggs, more larvae, more pupae, more worker bees. Late in the summer, when goldenrod, gentian, and aster bloom, a change. Now eggs hatch into males, each with a rusty patch on its back, and next year's queens. They fly and mate with bees from nearby rusty patched colonies. Flowers drop seeds, seeds that started when bumblebees buzzed the pollen loose from the flowers, carried it from blossom to blossom. Joe pieweed, coneflower, milkweed, seeds that can sprout and grow into next year's prairie, next year's garden. First frost, flowers wither, turn brown, die back to the ground. Bee season ends, bees die too. Except what's inside this hole in the ground? Next year's rusty patched bumblebee queen. Seeds drop, snow falls. In the dark hole, all by herself, the new queen hibernates. She waits for spring, for the earth to warm. And here's the wonder. Her tiny body, not even an inch, holds everything she needs to create a whole new colony. Next year's bees begin with a bee. And then we have the back matter, uh, more about the rusty patch bumblebee, about pollination, about challenges that bees face, and then 10 things that we can all do to help all bees. So um, thank you again very much. And I think now we're going to answer questions. Hi there, thank you. This has been wonderful. Um, we, our first question comes from Hollis asking, do the rusty patch bumblebees have a favorite plant? They are generalists. They are bees that come out of the ground really early and go into the ground late. I do not know of a favorite plant, but I do know that it's a good idea to, if you're going to plant flowers for them to have a wide range from early until late. So from, you know, the very first ones all the way to the asters and goldenrods. So, uh, but maybe someone else has a different answer. But just all the, all the bee, all the flowers that are in the book are flowers that the rusty patch like. So there's a, that's a list there. If it has a favorite, we don't know. <laughs> um, one question that I got in my direct messages was a question, um, that actually you alluded to Phyllis at the end with the list of things that we can do to help bees. What are some things that we can do to help bees? Planting the flowers is definitely one of them. Um, making sure that there's pollen for them. Um, planting native plants in your, whatever, is, whatever plants are native to your area. So depending on where you live, that's really important. We tried to find plants in the book that were native from the East Coast to the Midwest. Um, I think we succeeded, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Lisa, you're our East Coast expert. Yeah, they're not, they haven't been seen here in a long time, although apparently West Virginia may have the rusty patch. But in terms of bees in general, yeah, we've, I, I do think the other thing is, um, uh, Claudia mentioned the Xerxes Society. That's a really good organization to join because they, they give you information about bees and other insects and pollinators in your own area. And just spreading the word about bees. Um, I, I've discovered, you know, I learned so much and the bumblebees are not honeybees. They are not the same thing. Um, and so just, you know, learning and sharing what you learn with other people, I think it's important too. Another thing that we can do is maybe not keep our yard um, spit and polish neat, but leave some um, little leaf piles around and little um, piles of wood that might be places where they can um, shelter. Hey, Claudia had some wonderful wood in the illustrations. 
So I'm curious, um, it's unusual to run across a picture book with three co-authors. Um, and I wonder if that influenced the publication process, if that changed how you went about, you know, taking this book from a, a manuscript that you were working on together to something that was, was published by a press. Ah. Well, Jackie, didn't you and Phyllis have a lunch with Eric, the editor? We did have a conversation at, about what we were working on with Eric. And we told him we were going to this retreat to work on this manuscript. And he said, well, I'd love to see it. Even if it's not done, share it with me. So that really energized us to work at that retreat. And we did, and we brought it back. And uh, he liked it. He took it to committee. And the committee liked it for the same reason that Claudia did, that here was this queen bee doing all of this uh, effort and succeeding at it. Um, I'm not sure the collaborating affected the way we wrote or the way that we um, took it to the publisher. I, th I think we were lucky that we knew Eric and that he was interested in it. And I think the collaboration really grew out of our friendship. I'm sorry about my phone. Um, and we just wanted to work together because we enjoyed each other's company so much. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Uh, it does. Um, there's a question here from Louise, which is, is fun. Um, she says, forgive my thirst for drama, but during your research, did anyone get stung? Stung? <laughs> no. No. In fact, um, bumblebees tend not to be as aggressive as honeybees are. Um, I was stung. Oh, you were? I'm yes, sorry. I was stung I um, on a, each fall in uh, Watertown, Massachusetts, there's a garden, a fall garden tour. You can go to people open their gardens. And I was walking past a garden. I was about to go in with big sunflowers and I sort of banged my arm into one and this bumblebee stung me. But I think I was <laughs> annoying it or, you know, I, I might've hit it with my arm. So generally we don't get stung unless, unless we're bothering them. They're, they're not looking out to sting you like a wasp might be. I'm sorry, Liza. I forgot about that. Well, it it was not a not a big deal. <laughs> I was just surprised. I, and I'm thinking, I was thinking, wait a second. I'm writing a book about someone like you. You know, <laughs> how can you sting me? So Joanne asks, um, do any of you plan to go into schools to read and discuss this book, or might you attend literary festivals or anything like that? Um, and she adds, it should be spread far and wide. <laughs> That's very nice to hear. We are uh, doing some Zooms um, and we love talking about the book. Yeah. Literary festivals would be fun. It would be yes. more fun if we could actually be doing things like that together in person. We miss that. Some of the festivals I've been hearing about are hoping to be back to in person this fall. So mm -hmm. knock wood, fingers crossed that everything keeps going in a direction where that is possible. Yes, I guess the Brattleboro, Vermont uh, Literary Festival is still trying to decide about that. And I think a lot of people are in that position. So Nan asks, um, I've heard about author illustrator collaborations. Are multiple author collaborations like this one common? I don't think so, I don't know. I don't know either. Um, I do know that it's wonderful to be working together. Um, it's just, it was, it was a dream really. Someone asked, I can't remember, what did we learn from it? And I think our sort of general consensus was, we want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the things that made it easier for us maybe than for other people is that we had taught together for so long. You know, we'd led workshops together. We had um, hung out together so much in the faculty lounge early at taking these early morning walks. So we knew each other really well. And I think that was a big help. We knew each other's strengths and 
I don't know. We all have a similar sense of humor, I think, which was helpful. In my experience, collaborations like this are fairly rare um, in terms of what I see coming through the bookstore. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, anecdata, not comprehensive data, but that's what I've, I've seen. Um, I wonder, it, it's sometimes a lot of pressure, you have a new book just out, but uh, what's next for me? Does it, do any of you have any future projects you'd like to tell us about? I'm, uh, I'm always a little worried about talking about that ahead of time. <laughs> Fair enough, you don't, no pressure, you don't have to. Yes, we are talking, but we haven't said it, said it on anything yet. I have had the experience of being so excited about a project that I couldn't wait to talk about it with my editor or a friend. And once I had done that, I had spent all the energy that I had for the project. And I, I remember coming back home once and thinking, oh, I don't think I want to do that anymore. I, it's very strange. I don't even know why it happens that way. But um, it does make me reluctant to talk about it until I have something on paper that won't evaporate. <laughs> That's fair. Well, I, I do have a project that I'll be working on. I'm illustrating for um, a writer named Molly Beth Griffin, and she's written a collection of poetry about growing and how it's, it, it uh, kind of reflects or mirrors what growth and development in nature and humans too. And it's about growing is exciting, but it's also hard. So I'm in my wheelhouse again with a lot of nature. Isn't that, that really Molly Beth, wait, isn't that our Molly Beth Griffin who is our student? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. great. That's nice to hear. Phyllis and I both worked with her. Did you work with her, Jackie? I, she was in a workshop that I was in, but I did not work. That's nice that we're all That's connected. That's really nice news to hear. <laughs> That's great. Speaking of that workshops, I would just like to say it's so wonderful to see some Hamlin faces here. So thank you for coming. Hamlin people. And some Vermont college faces too. Yes, yes. family and friends. It's really nice. So we are sadly just about out of time, but there is one last question that I've gotten in my messages for Claudia specifically. Um, Claudia, how did you land on the scratch pad method? It's really beautiful and it really looks sort of like a woodcut. Oh, thank you. It just went back to art school where I was doing some printmaking method. It looks like a printmaking method, but Scratchboard isn't. Um, uh, printmaking uh, takes a lot more real estate up and um, I wasn't really excited about reversing um, in the process. You have to reverse your um, images and Scratchboard is kind of like a subtractive um, method of drawing. So I start like a sculpture with uh, something that I, I kind of eliminate down into the, the image. And I just love it. I, I have a degree in archeology span and I kind of think I just like to dig in things. I also like to garden too. So it must be something in my nature, but yeah. So it goes back a long ways. I've been working in it for about 25 years. Fabulous. Well, it's gorgeous and very well suited to this book. So a, a perfect pairing of and illustration. Um, Thank you so much to all of you. This has been really a fascinating evening and a lovely presentation. I've so enjoyed oh. hearing from you. Thanks to everybody who came and it's so much fun to see all these familiar faces. It's wonderful. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. It's been thank wonderful. Thank you for having us and thank you all for coming. Thanks Rachel. Audience, uh, you can order these books that we've been discussing tonight at northshire.com. Thank you all for taking the time to spend this evening here with us tonight, and we will see you at another Northshire Live again event again soon, I hope. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye.